This is one of two lectures on family planning and family building that have been split into two parts due to their length. The second handles adoption and assisted reproductive technologies, such as IVF. Please note, this lecture deals with the topic of abortion, which is a sensitive topic for many people, as well as contraception. Another important thing to remember, much of the language in this lecture refers to women, mothers, or pregnant women when discussing these issues, in large part because the existing data, scholarship, and law or policy language that I draw from exclusively refers to women. For example, many surveys on these topics still only target cisgender women. These issues actually affect all of us, though, including cisgender women, trans men, and non-binary people who, who can become pregnant, as well as people who can't, who are, of course, also affected by these issues and decisions in different ways every day. Before the Industrial Revolution, birth control devices in America relied largely on condoms for men, fashioned from linen or from animal intestines in some cases, and various home remedies for women, ranging from douches to crude barrier methods made of cotton or other materials. Many women also used herbs or other surgical methods to induce early abortion. We'll talk about that later in this lecture. The invention of rubber vulcanization in 1839 soon led to the beginnings of a U.S. contraceptive industry producing condoms, called rubbers still sometimes because of their origins this way, interuterine devices or IUDs, vaginal sponges, diaphragms, and cervical caps, then called womb veils. This is an early model condom, by the way. It was not disposable like a modern condom. Rather, they were washable and reusable. You needed to wash them, dry them out, and the instructions on the box advised powdering the inside to make it easier to get them on, and then pulling them on like a sock. Remember, this is an old-timey condom. Modern-day condoms are not washable and reusable. Before the 1960s or so, however, contraception was often unavailable, expensive, expensive or in some cases straight-up illegal. And early contraception methods, especially the homemade ones, had a high failure rate. Inducing miscarriage, what we would call an abortion today, was actually cheaper and was a common way that men and women limited their family sizes. Abortion has been practiced for thousands of years. The earliest recorded method comes from an Egyptian scroll circa 1550 BC. It, along with infanticide, was commonly practiced even in the biblical era. Records of the practice also date from the earliest days of U.S. history. Colonial women used poisonous herbs in small doses, or sometimes a method called opening the womb, wherein a reed or some other foreign object was introduced into the uterus through the cervix. One of the so-called founding fathers, Benjamin Franklin, even published a recipe for an early abortion pill of sorts in his popular home almanac and textbook, The Instructor. The instructor was a bestseller and functioned kind of as an early Wikipedia of sorts. It had information in it ranging from basic arithmetic to recipes, tips on horse care, and even home medical remedies. The authorship was credited to George Fisher, though this is thought to be one of the many pen names used by Franklin himself. The text explains how a woman can bring on a missed menstrual period. Early pregnancy was often simply referred to as a missed or blocked period because that is usually the first sign of pregnancy, but colonial women knew what that meant. The recipe involves the ingestion of different combinations of herbal concoctions like penny royal water and bellyache root, none of which, FYI, would be available today, are particularly safe, or even proven to be medically effective by modern standards. Please don't try this at home. Also, at the end of the recipe, female readers are advised to avoid the problem in the future by staying away from, quote-unquote, pretty fellows, i.e. handsome men, indicating that Franklin, or the author, knew exactly what he was writing about. In the Victorian era, patent medicines to end early pregnancies were widely and openly advertised, albeit with the same euphemisms used in Franklin's era. For example, they promised to bring on a blocked menstrual period, or regulate a woman's menstrual cycle, or restore her courses. This ad for Dr. Lance's cotton root pills claims that the product is, quote, the most powerful female regulator known, meaning it regulates or restores the menstrual cycle. 
but also warns the pills should not be taken during pregnancy, which is another hint. Many of these pills would have contained toxic drugs, like ergotrate, which causes poisoning and intense muscle contractions to bring about miscarriage. Historical research on abortion during this period indicates that it was most often practiced by married women with two or more existing children. So married women of the era may have seen it as one of the few options out there for limiting the number of children they had. Ending a pregnancy was dangerous, of course, but so was childbirth. During this period, approximately 1 in 100 women died in the process of giving birth. Up until the late 19th century, abortion was legal up until quickening, around the fourth month of pregnancy, which is the time when the expectant mother can first feel fetal movements. Most religious authorities accepted early abortions, including the Catholic Church, which, until 1869, took the official stance that abortion was to be permitted until quickening, or what they called insolment. Many religious authorities felt that a human soul couldn't reside in an unformed body, and until the fetus began to move, there was no human soul in evidence. But by the late 1800s, states began passing laws outlawing abortion, as well as other methods of family planning. Some of the drive to outlaw certain family planning methods came from fears that many were unsafe, and they were. Some also came from the burgeoning eugenics movement. The term eugenics, combining the Greek words eu, meaning good, and genus, or genes, meaning born, was coined by Sir Francis Galton in 1883. Eugenicists believed that the same selective breeding methods that were used to breed cattle could be applied to human beings to create a race of super-intelligent and physically fit men and women. But when they noticed that in the late 1800s, the birth rate for native-born white, middle, and upper-class women had, become, had begun to fall from over seven live births per woman to a little under four, they became alarmed, especially because the birth rates for immigrants, the Irish, Southern and Eastern Europeans, non-white women, and the poor remained high. This caused many social commentators to worry that the families they believed to be less worthy were on the way to outbreeding families they considered to be of better breeding stock. Eugenicists fought to criminalize most forms of family planning, reasoning that it was disproportionately being used by the kind of wealthy families they wanted to see having more babies instead of fewer. In 1873, Congress passed a law banning the dissem dissemination of obscene, lewd, or lascivious material, as well as any methods of or information about birth control. These laws were called Comstock Laws, named after proponent Anthony Comstock. Other eugenicists pushed for limits on immigration from places like Southern Europe, Asia, and Ireland, places that sent people who were believed to be mentally inferior to Northern European whites to the United States and in many cases enacted forcible sterilization policies, which were used against prisoners, women and men in institutions, and poor women seeking publicly subsidized care from city hospitals. The philosophies and methods of the American eugenics movement, particularly laws which allowed for the involuntary sterilization of people in state institutions, were later enthusiastically adopted by Adolf Hitler and his Nazi government as the first step in what later ended in the genocide of the final solution. I have studied with interest the laws of several American states concerning prevention of reproduction by people whose progeny would, in all probability, be of no value or be injurious to the racial stock, wrote Hitler in some of his early papers. One of his earliest policy pushes to this end was concerning the forcible sterilization and then later the mass murder of people in institutions all throughout Germany, people with cognitive disabilities, mental illness, and in some cases simply physical disabilities that Hitler and his Nazi government deemed to be hereditary or, quote, injurious to German racial stock. For American eugenicists, the primary tool to achieve their ends, as mentioned before, was involuntary sterilization, and it was widely practiced in many states, targeting usually the most vulnerable people. Asylums, or psychiatric hospitals, routinely performed sterilizations on women and men, sometimes during other surgeries, without their knowledge or consent. States even used involuntary sterilization to punish people convicted of crimes, like theft. 
In most of these cases, classist, sexist, racist, and also ableist attitudes about who was worthy to reproduce played a large role in determining who got targeted. Enter this woman, Carrie Buck. Buck's story is a really sad one. She was born to an impoverished mother but placed in foster care as a child after her mother was institutionalized in an asylum called the Virginia State Colony for Epileptics and the Feeble-Minded. Buck's mother, Emma, was committed on charges of immorality, prostitution, and having syphilis. Back then, women who were accused of having sex outside of marriage were often thought to suffer from some kind of moral insanity. And often the term feeble-minded was used as a catch-all to describe any condition from epilepsy to mental illness to alcohol or drug addiction, or in the case of many women, simply being sexually active when they weren't married. Carrie Buck herself became pregnant and gave birth to an, as an unmarried mom when she was 17 years old. It's believed she was actually raped by a family member, the nephew of her foster parents, but her foster family, the Dobbs, used the pregnancy as a justification to have her committed to the same asylum her mother had been a patient in. The Dobbs argued that Carrie having a child outside of marriage proved that she was promiscuous and feeble-minded like her mother. The asylum used her to test a new Virginia law, the 1924 Eugenical Sterilization Act. They argued that Carrie Buck's mother was feeble-minded, that she herself was feeble-minded, and that her young daughter, Vivian, was also likely feeble-minded, though Vivian was a seemingly normal infant. Thus, they said, operating on Buck to prevent her from having future children was in the state's best interest. The case went to the Supreme Court, who agreed, granting states the right to sterilize certain individuals to prevent the nation from being, quote, swamped with incompetence. Three generations of imbeciles, wrote Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, are enough. The Supreme Court never expressly overturned Buck v. Bell, though states began repealing their sterilization laws following World War II. Because of its association with the Nazis, eugenics fell out of fashion. But involuntary sterilizations didn't go away. They continued quietly, as individual doctors and hospitals all over the U.S. and its territories were found to have sometimes targeted poor, mostly minority women, often those getting subsidized medical care or those receiving some form of welfare. These women were sometimes sterilized without their knowledge or consent during other procedures, like appendectomies or C-sections. Some were given tubal ligations, or had their fallopian tubes tied. Some were given hysterectomies, which describes the complete removal of the uterus. A woman might not even realize that it had happened to her until she failed to ever have a period again, in the case of a hysterectomy. If a woman's tubes were tied, she might only suspect why she was never able to become pregnant. Doctors who performed these procedures later argued that they were in the best interest of everyone since poor women were believed to be a drain on state resources. The practice became so common that black women in the South nicknamed it the Mississippi appendectomy, whereas women in Puerto Rico called it La Operacion. This is not ancient history, by the way. In 2014, a lawsuit was filed against doctors in the California state prison system for performing as many as eight hundred hysterectomies and other sterilization procedures on incarcerated women, many of which happened in the early 2000s. One doctor told investigators that he viewed the sterilizations as a way of preventing prisoners from, quote, having unwanted children that could cost the state money. Of course, people wanted to be able to control their fertility. They just didn't want the choice to be taken away from them. So, ironically, at the same time that doctors and states were performing involuntarily, involuntary sterilizations on some people, activists were fighting laws that banned other people from using birth control at all. This is a picture of Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger was a nurse who served women in New York City, often working in poor and immigrant neighborhoods. Sanger saw her patients dragged down physically, mentally, and financially by the burden of one pregnancy and birth after another and by the responsibility of trying to raise and feed more children than they could afford. She believed that the best way to fight poverty, empower women, and protect children was by giving women the ability to control when and if they had children. She coined the term birth control and, op and opened the first birth control clinic in New York City. Sanger was arrested repeatedly for distributing birth control methods like diaphragms in violation of New York's Comstock laws, but she kept doing it. The laws even prevented people from telling other people how to use contraceptives. 
It was considered obscene speech. So Sanger gave presentations where she covered her mouth with a gag, shown here, and wrote the information on a chalkboard instead. Sanger is a complicated historical figure, by the way, because she was also a eugenicist, but her fight for the right to birth control has had a lasting impact. In Sanger's time, the most commonly used methods of contraception would have been barrier methods, either condoms, like that scary rubber one at the beginning, or devices like these, now called cervical caps or diaphragms. Back then, they were made of rubber rather than latex, and they were placed far up inside the vagina so that they covered the cervix. Sanger and other birth control activists dreamed of something better, though. Specifically, Sanger wanted a form of birth control that a woman had complete control over and that she could use even without her male partner's knowledge. Sanger recognized that abusive partners sometimes like to keep their wives constantly pregnant or caring for many children as a way of preventing them from leaving. So what if there were something like a pill that a woman could take to keep her from getting pregnant? In the 1940s, emerging research on hormones and their regulation of bodily functions like ovulation raised hope in Sanger and other activists that maybe, just maybe, a pill that prevented people from becoming pregnant could actually be invented someday. Sanger spent much of her later life raising money and working with research scientists and doctors to encourage research into that idea. By the 1950s, Human trials on the first birth control pills had begun, and formulas were submitted to the FDA for approval. In 1961, oral contraceptives, so-called birth control pills, finally became available by prescription. Hormonal birth control was so revolutionary, it came to simply be called the pill. No other name needed, and that's still what we call it today. Time magazine marked its debut with a picture of it in the cover, like it was a celebrity. The pill did all the things Sanger once dreamed of. It put the decision to have children straight into the hands of the person who would be birthing them. It also allowed couples to practice contraception without sacrificing spontaneity or pleasure by having to gear up with layers of literal rubber, later latex, first. And it was effective. A lot of earlier methods of contraception failed a lot. They might work sometimes, helping you to space out your kids somewhat, but they were no guarantee. When used correctly, though, the pill can be up to 99% effective. This allowed a revolutionary new idea to spread. What if you could just have sex because you wanted to? What if you didn't have to be planning a family at all? What if you weren't even married? The ability to control fertility without sacrificing sexual relationships also gave women significantly more freedom to make long-term educational and career plans. Because the pill was soon so widespread, it also heightened the debate about the moral and health consequences of premarital sex and promiscuity. Social conservatives and religious authorities worried then, as today, that allowing people to have sex for intimacy or just plain fun would ultimately lead to immorality or the collapse of marriage and family as social institutions. Like I said, the pill was revolutionary but many states still had old Comstock laws on the books when it was introduced. Many U.S. states still forbade the distribution or use of contraceptives by unmarried people, married people, or both until the 1960s. These laws were finally overturned in a Supreme Court case called Griswold v. Connecticut. Griswold is an interesting case because in a vote of 7-2, to two, the Supreme Court invalidated the law on the ground that it violated the right to marital privacy. Although the Bill of Rights does not explicitly mention privacy as a right, Justice Douglas wrote in his majority opinion that the right was to be found in the penumbras and emanations of other constitutional protections. This right to privacy would be cited in other cases that followed. The privacy standard set down in Griswold opened the door for what has probably been the most controversial and one of the most famous Supreme Court decisions of all time, Roe v. Wade, handed down in 1973, wherein the Supreme Court held that states could not limit women's access to abortion in the first trimester based on the right to privacy set down in Griswold. The original language of Roe v. Wade also opened the door, however, for regulation as pregnancy progressed. In the second trimester, according to the decision, states are allowed to regulate only insofar as to reasonably safeguard maternal health. 
by the third trimester, a benchmark that has been adjusted since to post-viability. Viability refers to the point at which a fetus could reasonably survive outside its mother's body. States may limit abortion in the access of safeguarding fetal life. In September of 2021, Texas enacted SB, or Senate Bill 8, which bans abortion after the detection of cardiac activity in the embryo at about six weeks gestational age. Senate Bill 8 was the strictest abortion law in the country at the time it was passed. Six weeks gestation is about two weeks after the first missed period. The embryo itself isn't six weeks old, by the way, because gestational age starts counting at the first day of the last regular menstrual period. The embryo at that point is closer to four weeks in developmental age. Most women don't know that they're pregnant until they miss a period, so the six-week deadline was criticized by many as a near-total abortion ban. The law empowered private citizens anywhere in the country to sue anyone who either performs an abortion or who aids and abets, or intends to aid and abet, anyone getting an abortion after that point. What the law meant by aiding and abetting was unclear, though it's possible it could include something as simple as lending someone money or driving them to a clinic. The lawsuits themselves could be for up to $10,000. The only exception to the law was if the pregnancy posed a risk to the mother's life or threatened substantial and irreversible impairment of her major bodily functions, for example, if there were an ectopic pregnancy. There were no rape or incest exceptions written into the law. Governor Greg Abbott said Texas will, quote, work tirelessly to make sure that we eliminate all rapists from the streets of Texas by aggressively going out and arresting them and prosecuting them and getting them off the streets. Reactions to SB8 were mixed. Pro-choice advocates, people who want to see abortion rights protected or expanded, were horrified whereas members of the pro-life movement, people who want generally to see abortion restricted or criminalized, hailed it as a victory for the unborn. Interestingly, at the same time Texas was banning abortion in the interest of saving potential lives, the world was grappling with the ongoing and horrifically deadly COVID-19 pandemic. While pairing back abortion rights, the governor of Texas, Greg Abbott, was simultaneously fighting local mask mandates as well as workplace policies that would have mandated that certain employees be vaccinated in order to work. In a May 18, 2021 executive order, Greg Abbott officially banned Texas schools or other government entities from making employees or students wear face masks if they didn't want to. Texans, not government, should decide their best health practices, which is why masks will not be mandated by public school districts or government entities. We can continue to mitigate COVID-19 while defending Texans' liberty to choose whether or not they mask up, Abbott wrote. The Texas governor also fought vaccine mandates for employees like nurses. Anti-mask and anti-COVID vaccine advocates also adopted the My Body, My Choice slogan used by pro-choice advocates to argue that the government, their employers, or even their local grocery stores didn't have the right to make them wear a face mask if they didn't want to. It is an ironic tension. COVID, after all, has killed more than a million Americans at the time of the recording of this lecture. One particularly vulnerable group were pregnant women and fetuses or embryos. Research tells us that pregnant women who become infected with COVID, for example, are more likely to miscarry. In these somewhat contradictory legislative pushes, Texas created a system where, on one hand, a pregnant person is required to carry to term in the interest of protecting their embryo or fetus, whereas their neighbor or teacher or nurse still can't be asked to cover their mouth or nose in public to protect the life of that same embryo or fetus. Texas SB8 was challenged in court, but the Supreme Court opted to let it take effect while deliberating its decision on a related case. Then, on June 24, 2022, the Supreme Court handed down a decision that officially reversed Roe v. Wade. The case, Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization, was a challenge to a 2018 Mississippi law that banned most abortions after 15 weeks. Jackson Women's Health, the state's only remaining abortion clinic sued, claiming the new law was a violation of the right to abortion set down in Roe, and also a follow-up case, Planned Parenthood v. Casey, which held that states couldn't ban abortions before fetal viability, which happens around the 24th week of pregnancy. 
and Dobbs v. Jackson, the conservative majority Supreme Court found for the state of Mississippi and went farther, arguing that there was no constitutionally protected right to abortion. With that, the decision to legalize or criminalize abortion returns to individual states. Even before the Dobbs ruling, 13 states, including Texas, had passed so-called trigger laws, banning most abortions, set to go into effect when and if Roe was ever overturned. Other states, also including Texas, still have old anti-abortion laws on the books that are potentially enforceable. For example, though SB 8 only outlawed abortions after about six weeks gestation, on June 27, 2022, Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton announced that Texas prosecutors could begin enforcing an old 1925 law that criminalizes anyone who knowingly receives an abortion or provides an abortion. A pregnant person who attempts to obtain an abortion but fails could also be charged. Under that law, a pregnant person who ends a pregnancy, or even tries to, would be punished with a fine, but the doctor or provider could be tried for murder. At the time of this recording, a court has blocked the enforcement of that older law from going into immediate effect. It is unknown what will happen in the weeks or months ahead. For the most part, at least for now, states have a lot of freedom to do whatever they want. On the other hand, many more politically liberal states have swiftly moved in the opposite direction, liberalizing their abortion laws further and moving to provide help and assistance to abortion patients traveling in from other states. The ripple effects on the Dobbs decision are big and potentially quite far-reaching. In his concurring opinion, Justice Clarence Thomas argued that the court should reconsider other past Supreme Court cases that granted rights based on something called substantive due process. Substantive due process refers to the idea that the court can enumerate rights, such as the right to privacy, that are not explicitly listed in the Constitution. Thomas, shown here, listed a number of cases he thought the Supreme Court should revisit and potentially overturn. These were Griswold v. Connecticut, the right to contraception, Obergefell v. Hodges, the case that established the right to same-sex marriage, and Lawrence v. Texas, a case where the court banned laws against sodomy. Sodomy is an old term for sex between same-sex partners, or in some cases, even non-reproductive sex between straight partners. Though not mentioned in Thomas's opinion, other cases could potentially fall under court scrutiny for the same reason. Loving v. Virginia, the 1967 case that legalized interracial marriage, was based on a similar precedent. If these cases are also eventually overturned, it is possible that we will go back to a system wherein abortion, contraception, gay marriage, consensual sexual relations between same-sex or even opposite-sex adults, and even interracial marriage are legal and protected in some states and either criminalized or not recognized in others. In states that ban abortion from, quote, the moment of conception, meaning the moment that sperm meets egg, bans or restrictions on the use of certain contraceptives, specifically birth control pills, IUDs or intrauterine devices, and Plan B, or the so-called morning after pill, may be a next step. The reason being is that, while these methods mostly work by preventing ovulation, or the ovary from releasing an egg at all, some people believe that hormonal methods as well as intrauterine devices, might sometimes also prevent the implantation of an egg that has been fertilized. Whether that's true or not, some health providers have been concerned enough to stop offering them. Under Missouri's trigger law, nearly all abortions, except those done in cases of medical emergency, at any stage of pregnancy became illegal as soon as Dobbs was handed down. This caused some Kansas City, Missouri hospitals to briefly stop, stop offering Plan B out of fear of legal repercussions. IVF, or in vitro fertilization, may also be affected, since, since a successful cycle of IVF can create multiple blastocysts, more than the prospective parents may wish or be able to use. There is another ripple effect from the Dobbs decision and the scramble by more socially conservative, or red states, to enact laws banning abortion. Though most new abortion bans do carve out some exceptions for pregnancy terminations done in cases of medical emergency, 
There's always a difference between the letter of the law itself and how people understand it or choose to follow it. For example, in the period following Texas SB 8 and the Dobbs decision, research indicates that doctors in Texas have been waiting longer to offer treatments to patients suffering from dangerous pregnancy complications. Complications like ectopic pregnancy, shown here in the graphic, which is a non-viable pregnancy that is implanted outside the uterus itself, missed miscarriage, or first or second trimester placental abruption. All of these are complications which can usually only be treated by ending the pregnancy, which at that point isn't considered viable anyway. A study published in the New England Journal of Medicine from two Dallas hospitals reported on 28 patients whose water broke or had other serious complications before 22 weeks gestation, so before fetal viability and who, because of Texas laws, didn't receive medical intervention until there was an immediate threat to their lives or fetal cardiac activity had finally stopped. On average, the patients waited nine days for treatment, and 57% ended up with serious infections, bleeding, or other medical problems. Proponents of the new abortion bans point out that this shouldn't be happening, and under the letter of the law, it shouldn't. But when faced with the threat of serious lawsuits or even being tried for murder, many practitioners are scared to act. In July of 2022, Forbes magazine also reported that patients in many parts of the country were having difficulty getting prescriptions for certain drugs, which can cause miscarriage as a side effect. Arthritis patients taking the drug methotrexate, for example, have been complaining of doctors or pharmacists not wanting to provide the drug for fear that it could cause them legal, reper legal repercussions if it ended a pregnancy. The Dobbs ruling wasn't supported by the majority of Americans, though that's not really supposed to be a concern of the court itself. Indeed, interracial marriage was still opposed by most when loving was decided. 56% of Americans said that they opposed the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe, whereas 40% approved of it, according to a poll done a few days after the decision was announced. Women are more likely to oppose the overturn of Roe, 59%, compared to men, 54%. One of the biggest divides falls along political party lines. 88% of Democrats said that they thought the Supreme Court had made the wrong decision, compared to 53% of independents and only 20% of Republicans. In a survey done by Pew around the same time, 59% of respondents said that they at least knew someone who'd had an abortion, such as a friend, partner, or sibling, or potentially themselves. Despite the fact that most sexually active individuals will use contraception at some point, about half or 45% of all pregnancies that occur in the U.S. every year are unplanned or unintended. This is a problematic statistic because data collected by Barber et al. in 2012 showed that unwanted and mistimed children got fewer parental resources, less warmth, were subjected to harsher punishment, and had worse health outcomes even when they were compared to wanted siblings in the same homes. On average, U.S. women say they want to have about two children. To accomplish that goal, a person will spend close to three years pregnant postpartum or attempting to become pregnant, and about three decades, more than three quarters of their reproductive life, trying to avoid an unintended pregnancy. Not surprisingly, most unintended pregnancies are caused by either the non-use of contraception or the inconsistent and incorrect use of contraception. Only about 5% of unplanned pregnancies occur in cases where contraception is used continuously and correctly, but fails. Happily, the rates of unintended pregnancy and teen pregnancy both have been falling in recent years. This has led to an overall decrease in the U.S. abortion rate since the 1980s, even before the Dobbs decision. Still, the experience of having an abortion is not an uncommon one. Approximately 18% of all pregnancies in 2017 ended in abortion in the United States. Across the whole country, that adds up to over 800,000 abortion procedures in a given year. At 2014 rates, approximately one in four, or 24% of U.S. women will have an abortion by age 45. So what do we know about this most controversial medical procedure? Well, 
88% of abortions in the United States are first trimester procedures, meaning they happen within the first 12 weeks. Most of those, over 64%, happen before eight weeks gestation, before the embryo officially becomes a fetus. Again, it is important to note that since gestational age is calculated from the first date of the patient's last normal menstrual period, the embryo or fetus is often about two weeks younger in actual developmental age. That's because conception happens after ovulation, which is usually two weeks after the start of menstrual bleeding. Because most abortions happen in the first trimester anyway, and due to states cracking down on access, medication abortions are becoming far more common than surgical ones. These use the so-called abortion pill, actually a dose of a drug called mifepristone, which blocks the body's own progesterone, causing the embryo or fetus to stop developing. This is followed by a dose of a drug called misoprostol, which causes the uterus to cramp and expel the pregnancy. Second trimester procedures tend to be far more controversial, but they are also much rarer. About 10% of abortions in the United States happen between 13 and 20 weeks. 1.3% happen after 21 weeks. Viability happens around 24 weeks. Very few doctors in the country will, per will perform later term procedures, so getting one often involves traveling to another state, taking significant time off work, and undergoing a multi-day process of surgical intervention. Okay, so what do we know about people who make this difficult decision? Statistics published by the Guttmacher Institute give us some idea of the kinds of people who are statistically most likely to have abortions. One particularly surprising fact is that more than half of them, 61%, already have one or more existing children. Many anti-abortion laws in the U.S. pre-Dobbs mandated things like waiting periods, mandatory ultrasounds, or that abortion patients be required to listen to the fetal heartbeat under the assumption that pregnant people were choosing abortion because they were ignorant of the facts surrounding fetal development, or that they just didn't understand how rewarding parenthood could be. But people who have birthed one or more children already usually do understand these things. Surveys of people who go on to terminate later pregnancies find that most cite their previously born children as a reason, arguing that another baby will prevent them from supporting or caring for their existing children, for example. Second, and less surprisingly, most abortion patients are single. About 56% were neither married nor cohabiting at the time that they made the decision. Most are young, 58% are in their 20s, 18% in their teens. The majority are low income. 42% of abortions are obtained by people living below the federal poverty line, another 27% among the near poor. And finally, abortion patients are disproportionately minority. 30% of abortion patients were black, 36% were white, 25% Latina, and 8% were classified as other. All of the previously discussed statistics are from when abortion was still legal in all 50 states and territories. The overturn of Roe v.ersus Wade can be expected to affect the number of people who have abortions somewhat, but it won't eliminate the practice by any means. It's hard to collect statistics on an illegal activity, but the Washington Post published an expose in 1966, when abortion was still illegal in all U.S. states, estimating that as many as one in five pregnancies were nonetheless ended by abortion. If this seems high, remember unplanned or unwanted pregnancies were more common in the 1960s and before, since contraceptive options were more limited. The experience of getting an abortion back then was very different, depending on whether you were wealthy or well-connected or poor. Many wealthy women simply traveled to countries, or later U.S. states, where abortion was legal, like Sweden, or just easier to find, like Mexico. The woman in the picture, a protester at a pro-choice rally, holds up a handmade sign indicating that she herself traveled to Mexico in 1956 for this reason. Some found private doctors who were willing to help. For first trimester procedures back then, that was usually by performing a simple and quick operation called a DNC, where the mouth of the womb, or cervix, is opened, and the contents of the uterus are removed using a small instrument called a curette. In some states, a pregnant woman could get a legal abortion at a hospital if she found two separate doctors or psychiatrists who were willing to testify to the hospital ethics board that she was suicidal enough that the pregnancy represented a risk to her life. All of these options were more available to people with means.
For poor women, abortions still happened, but were more likely to be unsafe. A legal, medically supervised abortion is actually a relatively safe procedure. Statistically, a first trimester abortion, which most are, is safer than getting your tonsils or appendix out, mostly because the biggest risk from most surgeries comes from the anesthesia, and first trimester abortions generally aren't done under general anesthesia. Statistically, having an abortion is even safer than a full-term pregnancy and birth. According to a 2012 study published in the Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, a woman is 14 times more likely to die during childbirth than she is as a result of a legal abortion. However, like any other medical procedure, what is safe when done by a trained professional operating in sterile conditions can be deadly when performed by an untrained person using unsafe means. In the pre-Row era, and even today, in the U.S. and globally, poor women sometimes turn to unsafe means to end their pregnancies. Some tried ingesting toxic substances or inflicting physical trauma on their bodies to induce miscarriage. Others attempted to perform surgery on themselves in their homes. Others turned to so-called back-alley practitioners that they would learn about by quietly asking friends. Before 1973, illegal abortion rings were listed as a source of income for organized crime groups, along with things like drug smuggling. Some back-alley practitioners were relatively safe. Others were not. As a result, stories of deaths from unsafe abortions, usually as the result of infection, poisoning, uterine perforation, hemorrhage, or embolisms, like this Washington State woman's death in 1967, were a not uncommon sight in newspapers. According to a 2020 World Health Organization report, approximately 45% of all abortions globally are considered unsafe today, meaning they are performed in unsanitary conditions, using unsafe means, and or by someone who isn't properly trained. The majority of these happen in poor or developing countries. The WHO actually estimates that unsafe abortions are responsible for between 4.7 and 13.2% of all maternal deaths, deaths occurring among pregnant women or women who have just given birth worldwide. Abortion is one of the most divisive issues in U.S. politics. Many American voters are so-called single-issue voters on this particular topic, meaning a candidate's stance on abortion is the primary or only issue they look at when deciding how to vote. Many American evangelicals and Catholics, for example, who disapproved of much of President Donald Trump's personal or public behavior, still voted for him because he promised to work toward overturning Roe v. Wade, and he did. Up until recently, slightly more Americans said the label pro-life described their viewpoints better than the term pro-choice. However, as discussed before, the majority of Americans didn't want to see Roe v. Wade overturned. And the majority, even many who personally self-identified as pro-life, still believed it should be legal. When it comes to this issue, Americans tend to be more conservative than people in other wealthy countries. When asked if a woman should be permitted to have an abortion if she simply wants one, 64% of French people and 60% of Canadians said yes. Only 42% of Americans think simply wanting to end a pregnancy is a reason abortion should be permitted. When you add in factors like pregnancy as a result of rape, for example, the agreement goes way higher. There's a paradox here, though. Even though Americans are more likely to oppose abortion rights or identify as pro-life, we're also more likely to have abortions than pregnant people in most other wealthy countries. Per capita, Canada's rate of abortion is about 75% that of ours. Germany's is less than half. So Americans are more likely to oppose abortions, but also more likely to have them than people in other wealthy countries. How do we explain this paradox? There are three major reasons why Americans are more likely to have abortions more often than people in countries like Canada, Germany, or France, despite the fact that we're also more socially conservative on the issue. For starters, America has a higher poverty rate than most other industrialized nations. Abortions are significantly more common among poor people, and more than half of people who opt to end their pregnancies are already mothers, indicating that this may, for many, be a choice driven by financial hardship. Second, our schools are less likely to offer comp comprehensive sex education. Pregnancy termination is more common among younger people, 
So not giving students access to information about contraception, showing them how to use it, and reminding them that they don't need to be ashamed for it has consequences. Finally, Americans just have less access to basic health care services. We're one of the few high-income countries globally that don't guarantee universal health care, and the most highly effective means of contraception, things like the pill, IUDs, or surgical sterilization, are usually available only through licensed healthcare professionals. Lack of access to healthcare, for many, can mean lack of access to contraception. As of 2016, 99% of sexually experienced women report ever having used some form of contraception. This pattern holds true even among Catholic women who use contraceptives at about the same rate as women from other denominations, despite the church's ban on most forms of contraception, with the, with the exception of forms like natural family planning or the rhythm method. Among women who report using contraceptives currently, the pill is still the most common form of contraceptive used. About 25.9% of women who are currently using some form of contraceptive report using the pill within the last month. Tubal ligation, or female sterilization, comes in second at about 25.1%. The male condom is third at 15.3%. Vasectomy, or male sterilization, at about 8.2%. Withdraw, which is the withdrawal of the penis from the vagina before ejaculation, at about 4.8%, and various kinds of injectable hormonal contraceptives at 4.5%. Because this lecture was written and recorded during a time of major social and legal transition, the summer of 2022, you should expect that some parts of it will be outdated by the time you listen to it. What will not change, though, are the tensions surrounding these issues, or the fact that topics like abortion, contraception, and the question of how far governments can step into the personal lives of citizens will continue to be matters of debate moving forward. In this way, the topics discussed in this lecture affect all of us. This concludes this lecture, and thank you for listening.